I'm Dr. John Cruz, and I'm going to be talking about the genetics of ADHD today. So as usual, I will start with the take-home message, and that is 30-plus years ago. Genetics was simple. We were looking for candidate genes, specific genes involved with dopamine transporters or receptors, and that would hopefully explain all of ADHD. Now we're well aware that the situation is much more complicated, so there are a few examples of simple mutations contributing to ADHD. There's also what's called polygenic influences. Mitochondrial DNA is relevant. Copy variant number issues are relevant. Epigenetic factors. And one of the most interesting contributors to the genetic influence is the maternal genetic nurturance factor, which I'll be talking at the end. So the bottom line is that although ADHD is quite strongly influenced by genes, everything to do with human behavior is always the product of a brain that's been shaped by a life of experiences within its given environments. So genes have a big role, but they are not the only thing contributing to ADHD. When I started in this field in the 1990s, ADHD was only a problem of children. So we thought that adults couldn't have it. And that was due to two big reasons. One is the siloing of a specialist who was treating ADHD. It was the pediatricians and it was the child psychiatrists when a kid got to be 18. Now, some kids do seem to largely outgrow ADHD. That's a minority. But most kids, if they continue to have ADHD when they got to be around 18, they left the child psychiatrist's practice, they left the pediatrician's practice. They were being treated by someone who hadn't known or met them before. Doctor didn't know about the existence of ADHD in adults because nobody thought it existed there. So even if they noted some symptoms, it's unlikely they would have assigned those to ADHD. This is an example of confirmation bias. If you don't think something exists, if it doesn't even occur to you that it might exist, you're not going to see it. What started changing that in the 1990s, 80s, 90s, was there were a number of clinics that were set up largely treating ADHD, which is the most common neurodevelopmental disorder of childhood. In many of these clinics, the clinicians were noticing, hey, it's the parents of the ADHD kids that are, they're late dropping their kid off. They're forgetting to pick their kid up at the end of the appointment. They are the ones who are not filling prescriptions on time. They're the ones who are confusing instructions and giving two in the morning instead of one twice a day. After seeing so many ADHD symptoms in the parents of many kids with ADHD, there was a growing realization of two things. One is that most individuals don't outgrow their ADHD, but two, that there was a strong genetic contribution to ADHD. And this ushered in a realm of twin studies and adoption studies. So twin studies look at the fact that fraternal twins, and that means brotherly, so that's probably not the best term, only have the genetic connection of siblings, so share half their genes, whereas identical twins share their complete genome, so their, their genes are identical. I'll get to that in a moment. So differences between rates of concordance, and concordance means the likelihood of two individuals both sharing a trait. If you have an identical twin with ADHD, you're much more likely to have ADHD than if it's just your fraternal twin or a brother or sister. Adoption studies were based on looking at ADHD in the biological parents and in the adoptive parents. And again, both twin and adoption studies showed that there was a strong genetic component to ADHD. Now, there are problems with some of the assumptions of the twin studies, and some of them are that new mutations can arise. Twins in a twinship of identical twins won't have exactly the same genes everywhere. There will be some mutations in each. Hopefully, those won't be in the relevant areas we're looking at, but those are small in number. Two is that identical twins may be treated differently than our fraternal twins because they look alike so much and they may be dressed the same and people may confuse them. So they're assuming that they have the same childhood environment as fraternal twins is not always accurate. Three is that the twins who wind up in these types of studies may be different from twins in general or might be different from the population in general. Despite all these issues, again, and particularly because adoption studies subvert some of these problems, there's a strong consensus that heritability of ADHD is considerable. So heritability is defined as the percentage of variance in a trait that's due to genetics. So 100% heritability means all the variable 
variance in this trait in ADHD is due to genetics. If it's zero heritability, that means it's all due to environmental factors. And to put that in perspective, something like height in humans, which is strongly under genetic influence, but it's also controlled by, you know, if your mother is starving during pregnancy or you were malnourished during the first years of life, that will have an effect. So height has a heritability of about 80%. And in most studies, autism and ADHD, schizophrenia, all come in at pretty high heritabilities of similarly 75, 80%. In contrast, depression, still considerable as 30% heritability, but much lower than for ADHD. So in the 90s, people were looking for what were called candidate genes, and they found them. There was some association in some family lineages between the dopamine transporter and ADHD, or versions of the gene for a dopamine transporter. And there were versions of the gene or alleles of the gene for the D4 receptor that were associated with ADHD. Created lots of enthusiasm and interest, but it turned out when many of these studies were replicated in other families, that that dopamine transporter gene had couldn't be found in the ADHD individuals. So the candidate genes or the strong genetic influences were not globally useful for predicting who would have ADHD or not. It's thought that these strong candidate gene influences may account for 15 to 20 percent of the genetic influence. In the next decades, when it became much more economical and faster, we could more quickly scan the whole genome of an individual or most of the genome. What came out were polygenic scans or polygenic risk scores, where we could look at the effects of hundreds or even a few thousands of different genes. And it turns out polygenic effects are very important across psychiatry, that if you look at the profile, variations in hundreds or a few thousand genes do substantially increase the likelihood of having a certain condition or not. However, one is the polygenic influence for many conditions and mental health overlaps with other mental health conditions. So it's not just one profile specific for ADHD. Many of these hundreds of genes include a risk for any mental health condition. And some of these genes only present a risk for a cluster for both like ADHD and bipolar and autism. And probably some of those hundreds are specific to just increasing the risk for ADHD. But again, these are genes that are only increasing the risk a tiny, tiny bit. It was satisfying to look at the whole genome and look at polygenic risk scores, but unfortunately, the genetic contribution found by these polygenic risk scores is substantially lower than that heritability number of 75, 80% would indicate. The other problem with polygenic risk scores is that they depend a lot upon the population that you're comparing them to, and most of the research has been done on basically white Caucasian individuals of European heritage, either studied in the U.S. or in Europe, and the polygenic risk scores are much less useful when you look at someone with a different heritage. So a couple other factors have complicated the genetic story. One is something called penetrance. So penetrance is Given that you have a specific gene, what's the likelihood that it actually displays the trait that the gene codes for? Although there's sort of claims that there's strong genes for something like Huntington's disease, that absolutely everyone who has a Huntington's gene, which was discovered about 20 plus years ago, is going to develop this horrible neuromuscular and psychiatric condition called Huntington's disease. But even in Huntington's disease, penetrance isn't 100%. So I used some example. The very first patient I worked with as a medical student was a young woman who had Huntington's disease. She had been adopted because her mother, around the time the child was born, it was clear her mother had Huntington's herself and couldn't take care of the kid. Huntington's usually doesn't develop into the 30s, 40s, and 50s, but in certain families, it trends younger and younger. Anyway, this unfortunate woman also had a brother who was put up for adoption to a different household because they knew there was a genetic condition. There were actually blood samples from this kid. The the boy died at age 12 of a car accident way before he could exhibit any signs of Huntington's. So even though Huntington's, if you live long enough, has 100% penetrance, but 
dying before you can show the trait is part of why penetrance is never 100%. Now, again, most often there are other reasons, other environmental influences, other epigenetic reasons, which I'll get to in a second, that penetrance is never 100%. So epigenetics. Genetics are what versions of which genes you have, but we know that it's not just the genes you have, it matters whether that gene gets replicated, made into proteins, or translated into RNA, then made into proteins. A lot of different chemical modification of the gene and the areas adjacent to the gene determine whether it will be expressed more so or less so than it might otherwise be. These are called epigenetic effects, so upon the genome. And we know that there are things like mercury exposure and trauma and cigarette exposure during early life that affect the methylation, they affect what histones are glommed on to certain parts of the genetic code. All of these have epigenetic influences and all of them are suspected and likely to play a role in whether a kid develops ADHD or not. Details of that or clear-cut demonstrations is still more theoretical than laboratory proven, but epigenetics certainly is going to have some role in determining who has, who develops ADHD or not. Then there's a whole nother set of genetic modifications called copy number variants. So with our different versions of a gene or different mutants or different alleles, different forms of the same gene, usually we're talking about just one mutation of one base pair in the DNA, which translates into one slightly different amino acid being coded for in the protein. And that can have profound, it can completely inactivate a protein. It might have subtle effects. It might even have no observable effects. Copy number variants, this is thousands of base pairs of DNA that are either duplicated multiple times in the DNA of an individual or are completely deleted. And there was a recent study, it wasn't focusing on ADHD, but it was focusing on child mental health conditions. And the good thing is it actually looked at a range, not just children who had a specific condition, but a traits, including attentiveness. So an important one for ADHD. And it was shown that attentiveness was genetically influenced by copy number variants. So copy number variants almost certainly is having also a substantial role in who winds up having ADHD. So most of the previous genetics is focused on the getting half your genes from your mother, half your, from your father. Mitochondria in your cells also contains DNA. The mitochondria is the little organelle, the little components, and you have multiple mitochondria in each cell, converting ATP into energy used by the cell. But they're also involved in a whole host of other regulatory processes, maintaining cell health, maintaining neurotransmitter manufacturing, fighting off oxidative stress. Most of the time, mitochondrial DNA is, in higher, is thought to be inherited completely from the mother, from the egg, and very little from the sperm. That even gets more complicated. There's some evidence that occasionally some sperm can contribute to mitochondrial DNA, but there are mitochondrial genes that have been linked to the increased likelihood of developing ADHD. But another element, which is the focus of the study I'll finish with, looks at the role of maternal nurturance and the genetic role there. So there is a direct genetic contribution, but also mother's genes influence her own life, influence the decisions she makes, including partner she chooses, including whether she smokes or not, including whether she's dealing with trauma or anxiety or ADHD itself, or having income affected by some of these things and housing choices. So there's maternal genetic factors which contribute to the nurturance to the environment she creates for her kid. Very recently, there was a study published in the Swedish population. They looked at a million kids born over about the course of a decade, and it looks like the numbers were reliable, that they were capturing almost everyone who did have ADHD in this population. And because they have good genetic records, they could also look at who else in the family had ADHD or who did not have ADHD. In some ways, this was expanding on the twin study paradigm. So they looked at not just siblings of the kid with ADHD, they looked at half siblings. They looked at maternal sister cousins versus other types of cousins. Now, when we look at these different groups, the genetic 
connection varies. So with a sibling, you share half your genes. An identical twin, which were not included in the study, you share almost all your genes. With a half sibling, though, you're only sharing a quarter of your genes. Cousins, you're sharing an eighth of your genes. But also, if we look at these different groups, if you're raised in the same household, the maternal nurturance effect, the environment that the mother created that's a result of her genes, should be the same for all the kids in her household. But if you look at maternal sister cousins, so, so if your cousin's mother was a sister of your mother, then they share their mother's genetic influences, whereas there's no maternal genetic influence shared among other types of cousins of your fathers or brothers or fathers or mothers and brothers. When they crunched all the numbers, what they found out was that Direct genetic effects, so again, mother passing on her genes to the kid, contribute to 66% of the likelihood of the kid developing ADHD. But maternal genetic nurturance factors contributed an additional 14%, which adds up very nicely to that 80% heritability figure. Paternal genetic nurturer effects were much smaller if they existed at all. The maternal common environment, the non genetic effects of how the mother's created a household didn't seem to be playing a role here. There was also a finding that there was assortative assortative mating. Mothers with ADHD tended more likely than on random to be pairing up with fathers who had ADHD. Really fascinatingly, we had a concrete documentation that how genes contribute to the way the mother raises a kid is a significant effect. It's smaller than the direct genetic effect, but 14% is not insignificant. This was done in one population. Might it be different in a different population? That's possible. Genes are complicated and having a multitude of effects. But again, looking at the epigenetic effects, looking at the non-genetic effects, there are other reasons why any individual is developing ADHD.